Well, welcome everyone. This is the last of our five lightning talks. These have been intense, fast, and wonderful. It's really been great to have uh, so much information going on in such a short time. My name is Martin Ramsey. I'm the Managing Director of the LAMP Consortium, and I will be your moderator today. Now, uh, we have a little bit more slack in our time to, in this particular section, but still, each of our presenters will have just five minutes to do their presentation. So presenters, I'll ask you to be ready as soon as the previous presenter finishes up, and I'll introduce each presenter very briefly so that we don't take time away from what you have to tell us. If you want to know more about the presenters, uh, the Open Aperio schedule has a nice biography of each one, and I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Presenters, when it's your turn, you can take presenter privileges by clicking on your name and making yourself the presenter. If you sent me slides, you can step through those at your pace. If you want to share your screen, you can do that too. And I'll be keeping the time. So if you see me hold up my dreaded alarm clock, that means time's about up, time to wrap it up. Um, so let's uh, get started. And I'll say that this time we're, we're rather um, North American focused uh, in the past uh, lightning talks, we've been all over the place, uh, but this time, at least as far as I know, our presenters are all from North America, and Wilma just added herself, so that put a star on Florida as well. Um, but we'll, we're going to start off with um, Jonathan Tran, who's out in California, and Jonathan, are you ready to give it a whirl? I, I believe I am. All right. <clears throat> all right. Just to presenter. All right. Yep, there you go. You got it. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jonathan Tran, and this lightning talk is going to be an overview of changes to uPortal projects. Uh, we had a lot of changes in the, the past year or so, um, and all of the updates to all these projects, they all include dependency updates uh, via automated tasks. And big thanks to uh, Christian Murphy for wrangling most of those pull requests that come in. All right, so the first project we're going to look at is uPortal. So we've had two releases, one patch, one minor. Uh, the highlights of those um, releases are things such as improvements to search and SQL statements, and also uh, exposing some more uh, configuration properties for things like the portlet thread pool and the uPortal task uh, executor. Uh, the next project that we're going to look at is uh, the notification project to or notification portlet, which had uh, four releases. W one is minor, three being patched. Um, and the highlights from that include things like configuration flags for some more stuff like disabling the default redaction, uh, support for refreshing uh, cache services, and also internationalization support as well. Uh, the next project we're going to quickly go through an overview of the changes is the simple content portlet. So this one, there was also three releases as well. Um, there's things such as um, adding a portlet to support web components, so it makes it a little bit easier to put web components into your portal, and also think um, some useful things such as adding support for replacing tokens uh, with properties. All right, uh, the next project we're going to look at is uh, a pretty big one just because there's a bunch of um, components in this one, which is the uPortal web components. So in this uh, repo, we saw uh, six releases, uh, three were minor and three were patch releases. Um, the big highlight from this past year is that there's a new sidebar nav component. And aside from that, there have been a bunch of fixes and improvements to all the current um, uh, components that exist within this repository. Um, last but not least, uh, um, we've also changed where these repositories live. So up until earlier this year, we have repositories that were living in, um, in github.com slash jsig and github.com slash uportalcontrib um, to give a better cohesive place for all the repositories, we pulled all of them together into uPortal project. And this is a big effort that was taken on by Benito. I believe he's in here. So big thanks to him for um, taking care of all of that. So this, uh, re this quote unquote reorg, um, it doesn't mean 
it means that we'll have everything in one place, but at the same time, if you're going to use an old github.com slash jsig or github.com slash uportalcontrib uh, URL, those are transparently being redirected to their new place under uportal projects. So even with Git repositories, if you do any kind of Git operations against your working copies, they would be transparently redirected to the new one until you go go in and actually update your your remotes. All right. Uh, with that, just want to thank all the contributors for the, their uh, contributions. Their contributions, and that's the overview of all the changes to projects in the uPortal ecosystem. Committed the ultimate sin. I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> so I see that Jim is saying uh, thanks for the quick update, and that's good. Uh, are there are there any questions for Jonathan? We have a little bit of time. Unlike the previous sessions, where I have to crack the whip and move on to the next one, we have time for a, a question or two. So the U Portal guys are all chiming in. This is good. This is good. <laughs> All right. Well, so we're ready to move on to uh, Michigan. Dr. Chuck, are you ready to take over and, and give your presentation? Yep, that's right. I performed the cardinal sin of not uh, unmuting myself, Martin. Uh, so <laughs> if you give me a screen share, uh, we'll get to it. Uh, you should have it, sir. I'm checking here. Nope. Just a minute. Josh, you know that the Fedora is when the Fedora is back, that means I'm talking about privacy, right? <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to screen share. Um I'll put an entire screen. Shallow. We'll have inception for a mid middle little bit. Um, yep. here we go. Yep. There it is. So you know that when I am uh, wearing my fedora, I'm on my privacy horse, and there's been a lot of talk about privacy. And uh, one of the one of the key things about being a privacy warrior is it's not enough. It's it's, it's totally pointless for me to just point the finger and say, "You're you're bad. You're bad. You're bad. You're bad. You're bad." And then like, what's good? And so part of what I'm trying to also do is show best practices for LMSs, which it turns out is harder, but for tools, best practices is actually not that hard. And so I'm trying to act as an example so that a tool provider like Piazza or Cengage or whatever, and of course these folks don't wanna do this, so that's a different problem, right? But let's say they woke up one morning and actually wanted to do privacy well. Then they say, Chuck, what? how do we do it? How can we be like you? And so I want to be an example. Now, if you look at some of the GDPR principles here, um, purpose limitation means why did you gather this data and why are you keeping this data and what purpose was it for? You got to you, you can't just say uh, I give up my data and then they can't they should tell you in advance what they're using it for. And if they say you're giving up your data so that we can do artificial intelligence and catch other students who are cheating, they should say that. Of course, they don't. Right. Storage limitation um, and data minimization is an important part of this. So what I want to show you is how I have in Sugi implemented some of these principles. So Sugi, of course, is come back. Sugi, of course, is my app store for education. And here is Sugi Cloud. And if you look at the URL of Sugi Cloud, this is the real administrator user interface. And I'm logged in as the administrator. This is the super user of one of my production systems. And so I'm going to do a demonstration using a production system. And one thing that's built into Sugi is a thing called Managed Data Expiry. And so we see here that there are 13,000 users on Sugi Cloud. And uh, within the last 180 days, 7,663 have not logged in, but I have their email addresses and first names and last names. That's what PII means. Now, Sugi is designed so that it actually doesn't lose any of your activity data, but it can anonymize them immediately. And so I'm going to push this button, this red button. See, it's red. I'm going to expire all the people who haven't logged in in 180 days. So we're going to press this button, and it's going to run a, a query. Uh, 
Oh, we only got rid of 1,000. I guess I have to do it a couple times. <laughs> if you run it at the command line, and it shows you the command line that you're supposed to run. And so I'm just wiping out data from my production server. And I've got people who got an account that logged in. Maybe Dave Evelyn, this is you. I'm going to get rid of a tenant that has been hasn't logged in in a while. That's just going to throw all their data away now. Poof. It's actually not going to delete all 44. I can make it delete all 44. But the idea is, is this server is running and serving user needs, and it's throwing away data because I happen to have logged in. I can throw users who haven't logged. There's 2,100 users that haven't logged in in 600 days, and I'm going to throw all their data away. Now, I'm not just throwing their identity information away. By the way, LTI, if they logged in, would give me back their identity information in a single click, so then I'd have it for another 180 days. So it's not a big deal to throw this stuff away. Now this, I'm throwing real user activity away, but they haven't logged in in 600 days, right? So Dave, I'm probably going to be throwing away some of your students that logged in a year and a half ago, two years ago. Boom. Not only does 100, right? And so that is building a system so that eliminating old data is natural. It's easy and it's it's quite natural. And so I'm just going to go and show you one of my bigger my biggest server which is Python for everybody, the world's largest and most successful programming class, and I can go and blast. I got a half a million students who haven't logged in in 150 days and have personally identifiable information in my system. And so well, I only did the first 1000. That's because I don't want this inner. Did it go? Come on. Oh, there we go. Took me two seconds to do it. And so I just throw it away. And so you can see that it went from 503,000 people to 502,000 people. And I can throw away some users. Let's throw away some users. Now, these uh, Python for Everybody is used by about 300 schools around the world plugged into their learning management systems. And so the point is, is this is an example of limiting why I want this data. Do I want to, am I going to do artificial intelligence machine learning on this data? No. Matter of fact, I'm going to throw it away. Now, if I was an LMS, I might have requirements to retain it for a certain period for, for learning history. But these are just tools that we're using, and I'm throwing away their data. And so that basically shows that if you think about it from the point of view of, I want to throw this data away to save storage in my systems and reduce my costs as a, a learning tool provider. Well, isn't it a good idea to throw data away? And by the way, these systems do have backups, but they rotate. And so, any, you know, they're, they're, some of this data might be on the backup for a few more weeks, but then it'll actually be gone. And so I won't retain a copy of it. I don't want to retain a copy of it. And if I was a tool vendor coming to you on your campus and said, this is my policy. I don't keep your data more than 180 days. I don't keep any data more than 600 days, da, 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 da. You might say, you know what? I can really trust you with my user's data. And so that's, that's basically an example of the kind of ways we can solve some of these privacy problems, not just point out that they are a privacy problem. And I'm done. Just like that. Just like that. Amazing. Amazing. So can I, can I ask a question, Dr. Chuck? Because I need to know this sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's one, as I understood it, you have sort of two levels. Level one is I'm going to wipe out their name and email address so that they're not identifiable, but they still have their, you know, this now anonymized user has attraction. There's, there's a track through the data. Is that correct? I, yes, it is. And if they re-logged in, I would actually reassociate. So that if you if you click the button, if I deleted those people and, and I clicked the button, you clicked the button to log back in, it would know your homework and it would know that you were Martin and it would know your email address. And, and that's because that it wasn't keeping something. It keeps the primary key of your user and it keeps the primary key that your LMS gives me that's an opaque identifier. Uh, so I okay. still know that I came from your LMS and what your opaque identifier is. And so I Sakai see. sends this big long thing of hex characters and that's who you are from Sakai's perspective and I keep that but I don't keep the fact that your name is Martin Ramsey and your email address right. and so I'm actually if you looked at that if you looked at that 
it was actually setting a bunch of fields to null, which means I'm emptying out text fields. I wasn't actually deleting records. Whereas in the other ones where I'm actually wiping out the learning activity, I'm deleting records. And because of foreign key relationships in the database, it's percolating through and wiping out every every bit. That was my other question was, okay, you since you got the relationship set up so that delete it here and psh, all these subsidiary. Yeah, I mean, Sakai doesn't have as as a, as tightly integrated a data model as Sugi does, meaning I can delete one thing and it percolates through and gets rid of everything. Right. Got I it. built that from the first day. So it was yeah. a lot easier. I built it from a privacy respecting perspective from the very first day. Gotcha. Gotcha. Very nice. Okay. That's, I appreciate it very much. This is, this is excellent. All right, Josh, we're ready for you. You're up. We're now going over to Massachusetts. Um, and I can make you present. Oh, you've got it already. You're the man. Go for it. But you got to you gotta unmute yourself. We've already discovered that. Cardinal Sin yet again. Hi, all. <laughs> uh, Josh Wilson here. So I didn't think I was going to be here this afternoon. I thought I was double booked. So I recorded a video for you. So we will be getting... I'll be giving you the uh, the full Simulive uh, experience this afternoon. So let me fumble through getting the video going. Hi there, and welcome to this lightning talk about the Sakai Roadmap for 2022 to 2024. I'm Josh Wilson from Longsight, and I led the creation of this roadmap development process. So first, Let's remind ourselves why we need a roadmap in the first place. A roadmap promotes a vision of Sakai as forward-looking, energetic, and continuously improving. It conveys how Sakai will evolve to better meet the needs of faculty and students over time. And it represents a shared agreement among the community members, like us, regarding the sequence in which enhancements to Sakai will be implemented. So how did we get here? Every fall, we follow a process that looks kind of like this one. In October, we surface some preliminary ideas. In November and December, we get a big pile of input from the community by talking in, at various working groups within the Sakai community. In January, there's a review of the roadmap and its iteration by the roadmap steering team. And then in late January or early February, there's adoption of the roadmap. This past year, it happened at Sakai Days online in the past, it's happened at Sakai Camp. And then in February, we get to work. So let's take a look at the feature roadmap. This is the portion of the roadmap that we show to people outside the community. It looks at new and improved features, not other kinds of technical and backend improvements to Sakai. So what are some of the new capabilities that we envision for Sakai in 2022? So we're, we're looking toward a new learning discussions tool that's a project that Longsight and Duke University are already working hard on. We envision a new design for tables and forms within Sakai. There's going to be a new course registration tool, we hope, and significant improvements to the meetings tool. And in the improved column, we suspect that the University of Dayton will provide even more and even better improvements to the lessons tool as they have in the last two years. A new design for calendar is on the list and a video assignment type is also on the list. So how are we doing? Here's a quick progress update. So in the new column, underway, the learning discussions project is well underway. You've heard a lot about it at this conference. The tables and forums design work has begun. Michael Green of Duke and Sean Foster of Western University have been working on a new tabless modern design for Sakai and its UI. The meetings tool has already has also begun to be worked on. Longsight has engaged a UX design firm and you've heard a lot about that work at this conference as well. Not yet begun is the course registration tool. In the improved column, lesson creation work has already begun at the University of Dayton and I'm confident that they'll submit and contribute some really exciting improvements to lessons as they have in years past. In the improved column, but not yet begun, is a new design for calendar and the video assignment type. So I welcome your input, your thoughts, and your questions. Feel free to reach out to me at wilson at longsite.com. And that's it, three minutes and 30 seconds. I will accept your praise. 
you get you get extra points. <laughs> Where were you last hour? <laughs> Um, so do you want to go ahead and talk about the uh, the question that Tonko raised? Yeah, sure. Glad to. So so the, the in the interest of time, I showed you the feature roadmap. So I will put I'll drop a link in the chat for the full roadmap. So there is a technical roadmap that's not represented here, which includes uh, some IMS standard support work that Earl Neitzel is doing, and that will have the effect of uh, providing support for QTI 2.0 in Samago. So that's that's one thing that's coming. And uh, you heard John Buckingham from Pepperdine and Tiffany Stahl from Virginia talk about a, workflow, a set of workflow improvements to tests and quizzes. So that's in the, uh, that's in the ongoing functional investments list that's also not in this public facing version of the roadmap. So uh, so yeah, so tests and quizzes is pretty important and there are two improvements to tests and quizzes that are uh, underway at this point. Okay, other questions for Josh? What do you all think of this as being a, a, a good way to let the general public know that we have a roadmap and we're we're working on things going forward. Oh, multiple users are typing, it says. <laughs> That's good. Ask a question, you get answers. <laughs> okay. Adam says clap, clap, clap in uppercase, <laughs> so forth and so on. Good deal. All right. Well, it's it's nice to have a roadmap and I'm I it'd be curious, it'd be nice to have Josh and Jonathan do a conversation about U portal versus Sakai in terms of sort of you know how we're how we're moving forward and all that kind of stuff. So um <laughs> thank you, Matt. <laughs> all right. Wilma, you said that you had something for us. So uh, let me I've I've made you a presenter already, so I'll let you you take it away, Wilma. Okay. Let me um I'm gonna try camera again. I've been having camera issues. <laughs> So we'll see if it finds the correct camera this time. Here we go. Should be showing. Yes. Yep, your camera's coming in. All we'll right. see you. Hi, everybody. There you are. Okay, so um, so I just have the one slide. This is more of a public service announcement than a, an actual um, lightning talk. But I did want to give everybody a heads up that we are planning for Sakai Camp 2022. Um, given that, uh, you know, travel restrictions continue the trend of opening back up and people are able to get out and about a little more, we're planning for um, January 24th through 26th. Um, that's at the end of January next year. And uh, as always, we have um, optional team building activities the day, you know, the weekend before. Um, so Saturday or Sunday, if people want to come in a little bit early, um, there's usually visits to theme parks and things like that. So um, the location will be the same as it has been uh, the last couple of years that we actually held one in person, which is the Holiday Inn Disney Springs. Um, in Orlando, Florida. And we are talking also about travel scholarships because we do understand that a lot of um, institutions have sort of locked down their travel budgets indefinitely. Um, so there may be some travel funding available, but we don't have exact details on that yet. Um, those details and more will be forthcoming um, via Sakai email lists and also on Slack. So you can look forward to more information about that. I don't know if anybody here wants to pipe in. I don't know if Dr. Chuck, you want to mention anything about Sakai Camp? He says that was perfect, Wilma. <laughs> All right. And Didi's already blocked her calendar, so yeah. excellent. Which hey, I'm take Wilma, I, I have a question, and it's a question for folks here. I am curious if folks could put a plus one in the chat if your travel budgets will not allow for you to go to Sakai camp. So so A, if you want to go, and B, you know for sure already that next year's travel budgets won't allow. So, the, so a plus one means I, I can't go because of travel funding. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> plus okay, one means I, mean, I want to go, and I know the thing, cash isn't there. It's negative. I'm not, I'm, well, I'm seeing some people typing, so let's hang on here. Don't know yet, says Charles. Won't know till July, says Christina.
And of course, our sample size is limited here. Looks like a lot of don't know yet. Budgers. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. Probably good to check back in in a month. Yeah, that's what yeah. it sounds like to me. I, I want to go where Dee Dee is and see these budgers. That sounds like a beast. <laughs> Just kidding. Right, I'm going to turn right. it back to you, Martin. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, me. All right. Um, that is all the official things that we have on the agenda for today. Um, but in the interest of... Um, Sort of promoting a few things. I'm going to try one too. Let me see if I can do this right quick. I don't even know if it'll work, but we'll see. Yeah, this is. I'm I'm learning something here. I'm I'm uploading a single slide uh, to Big Blue Button, and it took a little while. So that's why we didn't want to have people uploading their slides in the middle of their presentations. Uh, oh, Dr. Chuck says talk about my book. I could do that. <laughs> um. Yeah, all right. I will in just a second, Dr. Chuck. But tomorrow we're having our we have a monthly web conference at the LAMP Consortium, and we try to hit a topic that's going to be of probably more interest to faculty than anybody else. Um, but our topic next week tomorrow it's it's tomorrow at two two p.m. Eastern time. So for those of you who are in different places, um, that'll be a different time of day. But um, it's we're going to be talking about rubrics, and so if you'd like to join us, you would be welcome to. So, uh, oh, Christina says she sent this webinar to all her faculty. That's good. So, <laughs> um, and I'm getting more and more random people showing up, Christina, which is fine with us. If anybody is interested in this, just uh, tell me in the chat right now and I'll add you to the list. Um, oh, and Dr. <laughs> okay, Dr. Chuck, here, I've got copies right here. I wrote a novel. It's about technology in a subtle way. But it's kind of fun and it was fun to write a novel i'd never done that before so there you go take a look T check it out it's on amazon and so forth um or you can get a get a cheaper copy at uh i'll, I'll type it in the chat so um oh there we go thank you dr chuck <laughs> and thank you matthew yeah i'm missing those lamp conferences too we I'm, we're getting a lot of pressure to say you know we ought to do this get together more often and now that covid seems to be in the in the rear view mirror, maybe we can do that. So, um, yes. Uh, so, um, let's see. Uh, I have some public service announcements, unless anybody else has anything that we need to talk about. Nothing. Okay. Um, let me, I, I, I need to try to type. And my brain has gone blank. Here we go. There's there's the link for um, the book the book at a cheaper price, slightly cheaper, not much cheaper because Amazon cuts it to the bone. Um, okay, so Jen, um, let me. I'm gonna I'm gonna go look at the or Kathy. Sorry, I'm gonna go look at the uh, the chats that you sent me for things that we need to talk about. Uh, first of all, let's say thanks to our sponsors. Uh, Platinum sponsors are alongside and learning experiences. Two of the people who have been on this presentation today are gold sponsors. Sponsors. Entornos de Formacion, EDF, and Blindside Networks, and our hosting sponsor, Big Blue Button, which we all appreciate very much. This conference wouldn't happen without those folks. Um, stay tuned for the final email from our organizers, which will include a link to post-conference survey. We love to get your feedback. Please take a moment to share the experiences with us. Uh, please do that. That's so helpful. Uh, having been on the planning committee for this in the past, I know that it's really good to know what people think and what they like. Um, and by the way, the conference doesn't end today. There are a few workshops scheduled for Thursday and Friday. So Thursday, uh, which is the 10th at 10 a.m. Eastern time, uh, join us to test and refine an instrument that's been intended to, ass to assess the organizational health of open source software communities. Um, I've been a part of this project and it's it's fascinating. We're, we're trying to develop an instrument that lets us know uh, whether a software community is, is healthy or, or is beginning to perhaps show some signs of weakness. Um, so you would help us if you would attend that and uh, give us your insights onto that that instrument. And then both Thursday and Friday at 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time, uh, the U Portal team is going to talk about, of all things, having a roadmap discussion and first contribution workshops. So join them for that. This is their their U Portal meeting. And finally, um, you need to join us for our closing happy hour. 
celebrate the end of Open Imperio 2021 at a social gathering down by the waterfront in Gathertown. Um, wander around and take a dip in the pool and gather in public or private spaces to catch up with your colleagues from around the globe. The link has been added to the chat uh, and you can find out more details and access the information on the conference platform in Sakai. So uh, if you're if you're missing the things that that usually happen um, when you when we get together in person, here's here's a here's a virtual chance to do all that sort of thing. So uh, there, Kathy has posted it, and um, <laughs> and and I see that there there's arrangements are being made in uh, in the Netherlands for for a link up. That's good. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks very much, folks. Anything last else before we uh, before we end? Just a quick right. thanks to Martin for his uh, his moderating expertise. Having tried it once, attempting to fill his shoes, it's not so easy, folks. And he does a really good job. So thank you, Martin. Well, thank you for saying that, Josh. It's fun. I, I what I really like is is getting to meet all the wonderful people from around the world who are a part of this great community. And when I'm when I'm talking to uh, people who are interested in in what we do, and there's more and more of them, by the way, they're just they seem to be coming out of the woodwork. Um, I can, with with great veracity, say there's a worldwide community of people who are very enthusiastic about what we do, and they're all helping out. And you know, it just it it it's a really good community to be a part of. So, um, thanks to everybody for being a part of Open Aperio, and we'll see you down uh, at the waterfront, as they are saying, uh, in, in the virtual goodbye and the farewell party. All right, thanks very much.